Okay, so we're going to talk about lambdas. And uh, what I've got here is I've, I just wrote a little piece of code that gives some examples of lambdas starting with C++11 style lambdas. That's, uh, oops, that's uh, lambda 1 through 5 here. And then how some enhancements from C++14 came down in two cases. And then some enhancements from C++17 and some further enhancements from C++20. So we'll look at lambdas uh, starting with the forms that appeared in C++11. And I don't necessarily have an example of every syntactic variation. We'll discuss uh, those as we come to them. So let's drill into this function here and take a look. So if without lambdas before C++11, if you needed a functor, a functor in C++, it's not quite the same thing as what people call functor in other languages. You might more correctly refer to it as a function object. So uh, the algorithm for each standard algorithm, it takes a begin iterator and an ending iterator and a function object and it, for each value in that range of iterators, it calls the function object with the value. Now, a function object can be something as simple as a, a plain pointer to function in C++, which is in C, a pointer to function is the only kind of function object that you have. But in C++, it can be a pointer to a function, or it can be a... Um, an instance of a class that has implemented the function call operator with a compatible signature. In this case, my signature takes an int, it returns void. Um, if there's an algorithm returned, sorry, if there's a value returned by the function object used in for each, for each ignores the return value. So the fact that I'm returning void doesn't matter to for each. And in this case, I'm using uh, an instance of this class and I'm providing the um, instance to for each. So for each is going to invoke this function call operator and it just prints out the values. Now if you wanted to use the standard library algorithms that take uh, binary operators or unary operators or nullary operators, these are function objects that accept uh, zero, one, or two arguments. So in the case of for each, it's a function object that takes a single argument. You had to do it like this. You had to write your own struct with function call, or you had to write a free function. In this case, there's no state in this class. So this could just has, blah, could just has, could just as easily have been a free function that I passed here, but I'm trying to show the corresponding mechanism that a lambda function introduces, and a lambda function always creates some class that you can't exactly, you, you can get the type of the class, but you can't write it. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is just printing out all these values. And down here, the example with the lambda, you can see that it's become uh, a two-line thing here instead of having to write this class and because I didn't want the class to be visible outside this name outside this source file I had to put it inside an anonymous namespace with a lambda I can just write this code here and that is a function object so what is the syntax here well the square brackets surround a capture list, which we'll talk about in a, in a subsequent example, but in this case, the capture list is empty. Then there's a um, list of parameters to the function. If the function doesn't take any parameters, then you can omit the parameter list entirely. In our case, the function has to take a single parameter, so we declare that parameter list here. And then this dash greater void is a trailing return type that allows us to specify explicitly the function 
return value or the type of the return value of this lambda function object. Now in this case, I'm not returning anything, so the return type is void. I wrote it this way to be uh, as closely as possible mimicking what we would have had to write in the, the, the classic version. However, a lambda function will deduce the return type of, uh, uh, sorry, a lambda expression is technically what this piece of syntax is called. And the return type of the function call operator on this class that's created that corresponds to the lambda function that we've written, the lambda expression that we've written, the return type will be deduced automatically as if you had written a return type of auto. So up here on my little old school style, if I had written auto, you know, it's going to deduce the return type of this function, which since there's no return value, no return statement, the return type is deduced to be void. But I'm trying to write these little um, classic examples in pre-C++11, so C++98. This is what you would have had to do in C++98 if you wanted to do the equivalent of this lambda function or this lambda expression. Now, if you read the standard, what it basically tells you is that when you write a lambda expression, the compiler internally translates this into some class declaration that has a function call operator member function. The parameter list to that function call operator member function is matching the parameter list that you wrote in the lambda expression. The return type matches the either deduced or the explicitly specified return type in your lambda expression. And we haven't talked about the capture list yet, but the capture list will turn into more fancy members of this struct or class. It's not exactly specified whether it is a struct or a class. And from the point of view of your, your uh, from the point of view of writing code, it doesn't actually matter whether it's a struct or a class because a struct is just a class with default visibility of public. So when we say that this Lambda expression amounts to syntactic sugar, what we're saying is this highlighted text that is the Lambda expression is equivalent to that printer struct that I wrote with a function call member function implemented by hand. Uh, this is more concise. I can make this, um, it's still correct, and it's still equivalent to the uh, manual struct that I've written if I omit that return type, because again, the return type is deduced from the enclosed expression in the, or the enclosed statements in the Lambda expression. This is, ends up being the body of the function. You can reference the parameter values that were passed in. Um, here I'm referencing std c out is a global variable. No problem there. So that's your, your basic lambda. And everything that uh, comes afterwards is basically just a way to specify enhancements, if you will, to this basic um, this basic lambda expression. This is like I mean, this is not even the simplest that you could have. The simplest Lambda expression that you can have is something that looks like no capture list, no argument list, no argument list, and an empty body. That is the simplest Lambda expression you can have. It, it has a body that has no statements. It has a parameter list that's empty, and it doesn't capture any variables into its capture list. And in fact, because this parameter list is empty, you can even omit that parameter list entirely. So now it's just this bracket bracket is what introduces the syntax of a Lambda expression. And you must have, you must have some body, but the body can be empty. I mean, this, this is basically a function that does nothing. It takes no arguments, returns no value, and executes no code within the body of the function perfectly legal to write that is just nonsensical. It doesn't, doesn't actually do anything. Maybe if you needed to supply an, op an optional, or sorry, 
maybe if you had a function or a method that required you to pass a um, function object, but you didn't want anything to happen, you would pass in a you know, and basically an empty Lambda function. It would invoke your function, which would do nothing. Um, so let's look at our next example. Go back over here. And our, <clears throat> excuse me, our second example. So in this case, we've got our classic function object, but our function object is now a class with a constructor that accepts some argument and it uses that argument from the constructor to initialize some member variables and the member variable is used in the function call operator so if we come down here we see that we are uh, taking some prefix number here we're initializing our function call object and then we're invoking for each just like we did before so in this case it would print out whatever the prefix is, which in this case is 10, and then a space, and then the value from this vector of integers. And we can do the same thing in a lambda by putting members in the capture list. Now, with no an additional annotation, just the name of the identifier, the value is captured as a copy, just as I've written it in my C++ 98 functor up here. So, you notice this is um, this is an int. It's not a reference to an int. It's not a pointer to an int, and it's also not a const int, which we'll get to in a second. Why that distinction is important down here. So that manual func function object that I've written is identical in meaning to what this lambda expression does. It captures a value. Now you notice in this capture list, it's it's just a, an identifier. There's no type specified for prefix. So in the generated class, that the generated function object that the compiler creates, the type is inferred from the type of this identifier. And since this identifier is an argument to our function that is an int, then the um, synthesized member variable holding the value of prefix is an int. Now, although I didn't specify this as const int, um, it turns out that by default, all captured values are captured as immutable because the function call operator that is generated is written as const. So I guess technically to be as close as possible up here, this thing, this method should be const. So the this standard basically says <coughs> that the function caller operator is const unless you do something to say that it should not be const, which we will see in a second. And I said earlier that algorithms, when they take a, a function object that the function object could be just a function pointer and the rule for lambdas is that they can be converted to the equivalent of a function pointer namely a std function so let's just go back here one second to cover this point in the previous example so here the capture list is empty and when the capture list is empty let's put this in a variable and I can also say std function of return type void uh, and argument type int I need to include oops functional Okay, so <clears throat> std function, which is just kind of a, a nice way to encapsulate pointer to a plain function, a lambda function, or a pointer to a member function. It generalizes that. So a um, 
lambda can be implicitly converted to a uh, std function or let's see if I can remember how to do this. Or a function pointer, as long as the lambdas capture list is empty. And the reason for that is because lambdas that have state, namely the capture list, that means that they have to be invoked with a this pointer, and that calling convention is incompatible with raw function pointers. So anything that requires the this pointer to be handed around at, to, in order to invoke the function call operator is not compatible with function pointers. So um, the, the takeaway is as long as your capture list is empty, then a lambda is compatible with either std function or a raw function pointer. Okay, so let's go back over here to where we have a capture. So this is capture by value, and I've specified the identifier to be captured explicitly. There's another syntax uh, where you can say equals instead of the identifier, then the compiler looks at every identifier that is used inside the lambda and if the identifiers refer to uh, values that are coming from the the stack in other words they're not global values and they're not constants they're in this case it's a function call argument but if it were a local variable the same logic would apply it's coming from the stack essentially is the way to think of it so this it's c out is not captured by value or by reference. It's not captured at all because it's a global variable. But prefix is a local variable, so it's captured and it is captured by value because we used equal sign. And then this is a character literal. So the, you know, these are character literals, so they're not captured. They're just part of the body of the lambda. Now, <clears throat> stylistically, people have uh, advised that it's better to explicitly capture by identifier rather than using uh, equal sign because that way you're not surprised by what got captured. So if my intention was to only capture prefix and then you know for some reason I also referenced uh, values inside here, well, oh I didn't mean to capture that in my lambda that was a mistake so it got highlighted by the compiler but if I go back over here and change this to copy by value now uh, now suddenly I'm making in my lambda when that function object is constructed it's making an entire copy of this vector of ints and it's just doing something nonsensical with it so the general advice is capture things explicitly by name and that way you're not surprised about what's being captured and what's not being captured let the compiler give you uh, a diagnostic when you are capturing something you didn't realize so that's capture by value but lots of times we don't want to capture something by value because we're not going to modify the object and the object is expensive to copy uh, you know, a vector of, you know, 100,000 integers, whatever. We don't want to copy that into this function object just because we want to reference it. So in addition to copying by value, we can copy by, or sorry, we can, in addition to capturing by value, we can capture by reference. And in this case, I didn't follow my own advice there. I should have written reference prefix. So the capture list now has this reference syntax indicating that the item is the, uh, either the named item or all the named items that are referenced or sorry referred to shall we say in the body of the lambda are captured by reference and the equivalent uh, C++ 98 style function object is up here I'm capturing a reference to a string into a member variable and then I am referencing that uh, I, sorry, I'm using that, referring to it in the function call body, and I made this a uh, reference to a const string, 
n instantiate my function object and then pass it to for each. And the same thing down here is just that now the function object is this lambda expression, so it's not explicitly named. Uh, you saw before, I didn't state explicitly this, but you can capture a lambda into a variable. I did mention that the type of this thing is unspecified. It is a distinct type. Every single lambda expression is a distinct type. So even if you take two lambda expressions and repeat them, so these two lambda expressions are identical text, but L, L and L2 here do not have identical types. They still have distinct types because every time you write a lambda expression, a new struct or class definition is emitted internally by the compiler is essentially how it works. So the auto here deduced the magical type of whatever this lambda expression is. It's some internal thing from the compiler implementation. We can't actually know what type it is. But because I wrote these two uh, variables as initialized from a lambda expression, and every lambda expression has its own unique type, these two types are different. Now, I could assign L to L2, and now L2 and L do have the same type. Whatever that anonymous type was that was created by the compiler to implement this uh, function call object. So, let's just put this back to the way it was, and that will make Git happy. Okay, so this expression, I've captured uh, prefix by reference, and it is possible to mix in the capture list. Um, I could capture values by, I could capture the, the vector as a, by value, and I can capture prefix by reference. Sometimes you just want to capture things as a copy. Other times you want to capture things as a reference. You can mix and match the two. If you were to say whatever I, um, whatever I mention in the body of the lambda, if it's something that needs to be captured, this ampersand, like the uh, equal syntax before, will capture everything by reference. I can also say capture everything by value except capture prefix by reference. Uh, you can look up on cppreference.com the detailed syntax of this, but it's basically pretty straightforward. There's the single equal or ampersand saying what the default should be for capturing things that aren't mentioned explicitly, and then you can add in an explicit list of things to be captured in the particular way that you like. And again, uh, style guidance is mention all your captures explicitly. Okay, so next, and we're still in C++11 land here. Next, um, sometimes in your function object, you need to modify the internally held state. So in this case, I'm accepting this prefix as an argument to the constructor, every time you invoke the function call operator, I'm modifying that prefix. So this member variable inside my handwritten functor or function object is not no longer a const and it's no longer a reference. It's not, I'm, I'm initializing my member variable from whatever was passed in, but I have my own distinct storage. I'm not sharing a reference to the caller's storage. Now, if you need to do that in a Lambda, uh, and I'm not following my advice here, so we'll fix this capture. Just capture, not equal capture. Okay, when you need to modify any captured state in your Lambda, you put the keyword mutable after the um, the function signature basically. I believe if we had return type, let's see, is, or is it right after? Ah, it's after the argument list. 
So if you needed to specify the return type for some reason, you would put that after mutable. Again, we'll just drop that off because we don't need it. Um, and now within my function body, I can modify the state that was listed in the capture list. Of course, if I had local variables in here, you know, I, I could always create new local variables within the scope of this um, Lambda. The problem is that since they're locals, it's not state that is maintained between each invocation of the function call operator on this class that's created for us. So up here, every time I call this function call operator, it's modifying the state and um, it's a comment saying this should be const to match the walrus let me know <laughs> so um, I was saying that in the earlier ones you should have marked them const yeah yeah I agree it's gonna yeah. it's gonna probably trickle through like all of these I will um, no problem yes it's it's what I'm trying to do here with this stuff is show identically what the compiler is generating, but I'm, you know, I'm trying, I'm doing it by hand. So it's the, the fact that I forgot the const was a little bit off. Um, and in fact, since this is const now, you know, as so I'm getting a squiggle when I assign to this. And so this now need, this member now needs to be mutable, which kind of matches up more symmetrically with the placement of mutable down here on the signature of the Lambda. So that's actually. A good uh, thing. I would disagree with that. Um, the, mutable, the mutable keyword controls whether const exists on the operator. Uh, the. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying it's more accurately like this to match up with what the compiler yes. generates. Uh, uh, yes, that's correct. I remember reading through that on CPP reference. Uh, and on the previous one where it wasn't mutable, then the function call operator should have been marked const. Correct. It's unfortunate that uh, although the compiler is generating these classes and stuff internally, there isn't any way to get the compiler to dump it out so you can see exactly what it generates. Um, it would, I'm sure it would be ugly anyway. It would just be full of like double underscores. But uh, I'm trying to get to the spirit of that with the, the way I would have done it in C++ 98. Um, the rules are very strict and specific on the um, this function object that is generated for you by the compiler. It's very, it's very specific on um, what the behavior is of that generated code. And when you write it by hand, like I've done with the C++ 98 example, it's possible to, to have something that embodies the spirit of the lambda expression but in small ways differs like you know c plus plus 98 is not requiring that my function call operator be const unless my corresponding lambda capture expression or sorry my corresponding lambda expression was mutable etc okay so what we've got here is it's equivalent in, in, in semantics to this um, C++ 98 function object that I've written, where now inside the body of the Lambda, we can modify state and that modification is visible on, to the Lambda body the next time the Lambda body is invoked. So um, that covers capture by value, capture by reference, uh, mutable capture, and the last bit we're going to look at uh, for basic lambdas is capturing this. Now, in um, what I've written here, this part here, this is just some little class uh, so that I can do something that is the equivalent of um, in my function object, I am initiating sorry, and in initializing my function call object with a reference to some collaborating class. And then in the function call operator, I'm referencing that 
collaborating class through its this pointer. I'm not I'm not taking the this pointer explicitly. It's a reference, but a reference is like a a, a, a reference is like an address. It's just that references can never be null. So it's it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so down here uh, in the classic version, I've got my collaborator created. I've got my function object initialized from an instance of the collaborator, and then I'm invoking the um, function objects function call operator for every element in the vector of values. Now down here, what I've done is I just made another object just for laziness that extends collaborator and I wrote a print member function and that's because to capture the this pointer I have to write that inside a member function right there's no this pointer like down here in this lambda function this is just a free function there's no this pointer here I have to have I have to be inside the method of a class to have the this capture syntax work. And basically what this allows you to do is, I mean, a lot of the times you are inside a method of a class and you're trying to write a Lambda and you're trying to have the Lambda reference either data members or other methods on the class that contains the text of the Lambda expression. So if, if I capture this, then I can invoke a member function. It happens to be this member function on my base class, but that's fine. I can reference this member function through the this pointer. And I could reference any data members or whatever else that I needed to. And um, because the mutable keyword is not here, as we just discussed, the generated function call operator is const. So this function, member function that I'm calling, has to be declared const, which it is. If I needed to call non-const member functions, or I needed to modify member variables, then I would need to put mutable on this lambda expression. So. Um, if I do that, this uh, code down here with the lambda, I have my values, I instantiate the object, I invoke the member function on the object, the member function calls for each with a lambda capture that uses this. So when you're inside a class, um, capturing this ends up being um, pretty useful. Now, what it uh, ends up doing is it does not capture a copy of the object, it captures a copy of the this pointer. And it is, uh, this is the only valid syntax for capturing this. You can't capture this by reference, or I think even, yeah, you can't capture it by value. You have to write it just like this. If there were um, something else that I needed to reference that was, you know, not referenced through the this variable of the class, then you know I can capture that other thing by reference or I can capture it by value. Either way, it doesn't matter. So that's the last part of capturing in C++11. Um, and that is the basics of C++11 lambdas. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with a handwritten function object that you can't do with these lambdas and namely the main thing that you can't do in C++11 is this function call operator cannot be a template function with multiple template arguments because um, well I think strictly the way to say it is it can't be a template function with template arguments that can't be deduced by the argument by the actual arguments that are passed to the function call operator. There's other uh, things about um, 
how the the state is captured that are not easy to do with a lambda expression that you can easily do with a function object. I mean, obviously, a function object is just a free form. I, I can write any kind of class that I want. It can have all kinds of member functions, not just the function call um, operator. So in excuse me, in, in subsequent standards, what they sought to do with Lambda expressions was to generalize them further and make it possible for you to uh, cover more scenarios with Lambda expressions to eliminate the need to have to write by hand these function call objects, which are <clears throat> largely consisting of boilerplate. You know, the in my function call object, the only really interesting thing that's happening is this one line, but I had to write you know, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, you know, I'd write another, I'd write 13 other lines, but this is the only one out of the 14 that was of interest at all. <clears throat> so, uh, any questions on this so far before we start to look at uh, C++ 14 editions? Ah, there's a, Message here in the chat saying cppinsights.io is useful for seeing what the compiler is generating. I'm not familiar with that site, but I will check it out after we're done here tonight. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at C++14 extensions. So, the big thing in C++14 is in the capture list, the things that are captured can now, we can now specify an initializing expression for the captured value. Now, if we go back over here for a second, uh, it was this one. Okay, there was a subtlety here that I kind of glossed over, but let's take a look at it now. I needed this capture to be a modifiable value. Well, it turns out that if I try to say, make this a const, why did this expression turn squiggly now? I said mutable, why are you not letting me modify the thing that I captured? And it comes back to the fact that there's no type specification for these captured identifiers. The standard says that the type of the captured identifiers, which is going to be the type of the generated field member inside this generated class, the type is deduced as if it were specified as an auto argument to a function or an auto automatically deduced type in a uh, template function. So what happens is I put const on this because I'm not modifying this in the scope of this function. However, when I put const on it, then the deduced type of the capture is now not std string, it's const std string. And you can't modify a const std string. So I had to take that off. And that's the whole reason I had to introduce this variable in the first place is because my function signature specified the prefix as a const a reference to a const std string. So I couldn't capture prefix directly, and this can't be const because then the deduced type of the capture will be const, and then it won't be able to modify it. So in C++14, where I can specify an initializing expression for the captured value, here I can say the initializing expression is a const std string, but the capture is not const. In other words, it's perfectly valid to assign a const std string to a std string. And because my um, lambda expression is marked mutable, this is okay now. Now, initially, when I wrote this, I thought um, that I needed to say something like, you know, static cast std string to get rid of the const. And while that's perfectly fine, it's it 
doesn't end up being required. And I didn't investigate the uh, phrasing within the standard that allows that, but I'm thankful that it does allow that because I really wouldn't appreciate it if I'd wanted mutable state and always had to write casts on initializing expressions that happen to return a const object. That would be annoying. The whole point of lambdas is to simplify the syntax, uh, the syntax that we need to get our work done, not make it more complex. So uh, here, I'm, again, initializing from a reference to const std string, which is what my, I mean, I guess technically this is a value and not, or sorry, this prefix here is a value and not a reference, but I could, I, to be more closely identical to what my lambda expression is, I should remove that reference. But I'm storing it as a, a value of std string. I'm modifying it in my function call operator, and I'm doing that down here. Now, being able to uh, specify initializing expressions is very useful in the capture list because as you saw, without that, I have to introduce local variables whose only purpose is to have a single identifier associated with the initializing expression of these members that I'm trying to have synthesized for me inside the function call operator. So being able to specify uh, an initial value for captured state is handy. And it's not just um, referencing variables that I can do here. I could initialize some value x equal to zero, and then inside this body, I could increment x. And <clears throat> because x here is an identifier that is not within some enclosing scope of the lambda expression, it's treated as a field that is declared to be whatever the type of the initializing expression. So in this case, it's int, and I can manipulate that like any other int. But now I've got a way of having state that is named state that is captured within the lifetime of all the function call invocations on this Lambda expression. And I, and if it's mutable, I can modify that and I can use those variables inside the body of my Lambda without having to introduce them into some outer scope just for the purpose of being able to capture them and manipulate them. So let's just restore this back. Okay. So the next thing that C++14 gave us is I can specify that the type of the argument to the function is auto. And what that means is it's as if my function call operator were a templated member function. So just to refresh your memory, this is saying uh, the, the printer struct is not a template class or a template struct. It has a template member function. And as long as these uh, types that are used are distinct, then what I will end up getting is, and for every um, type that I use, the compiler will generate an overload for this function call operator. So down here in our manual example, I first invoke it on a vector of integers. So that gets me a function call operator that is instantiated for t equals int. And then down here, I've got a vector of std strings and I invoke the function call operator on that vector of std strings. So now I've got an additional overload instantiated for t equals std string. Now that's a very handy thing to have because it prevents me from having to write this function call operator repeatedly for different types when the bodies are the same. And of course, if I wanted to, I could always uh, specialize this for a specific type. So this is a specialization. Now, I could do that in my handwritten functor. I can't do that in 
a lambda. So I'm not, I'm I'm not going to do that because there's no corresponding thing in the lambda where you can do that. At least not yet. So the way we get a templated function call uh, operator member function is to specify that one or more of the types in our argument list is auto. I can have additional arguments in the argument list that are not templates, uh, template, uh, or sorry, that are not auto, that don't have their type deduced, just like I can mix um, template arguments and non-template arguments in any templated function or member function. So here, um, the body of this lambda corresponds to a template member function function call and I can invoke it on uh, a vector of ints and I can invoke it on a vector of std strings. So that was the uh, two big generalizations that we got in C14 is we got initializing expressions for the capture list and we got the ability to specify auto parameter names or sorry auto as the parameter type in the parameter list to get so-called generic lambdas. Now in C17, they um, extended lambdas so that the body of the lambda could be marked const expr. Now, if you're not yet familiar with const expr and C20 adds const eval, these are mechanisms for running code at compile time. So prior to C++17, if I had code that was running at compile time, it couldn't invoke any lambdas, even if the result of the lambda could be known at compile time, because you cannot invoke code in a compile time context that is not const expr. So if I mark my lambda as const expr, then it is equivalent to marking my handwritten function call operator as const expr. Now, in my little example code here, I'm not calling it in a compile time evaluated context, just for simplicity. Um, in this case, I'm, I've got a printer. Now, because the printer uses IO streams that can't be run at compile time, but I've got this little transformer that could be run at compile time. I happen to be using it in the transform algorithm, which is not const expr itself. So um, it's also using a value that is not const expr. So you, you, const expr kind of ripples through everything as a dependency chain. You can call a const expr function at runtime, but you can't call a non const expr function at compile time. And you might be asking yourself, you know, like, why do we even care about running stuff at compile time? What good is that? And the answer is, it comes up mostly in the context of um, template programming. The template programming has to go through crazy recursive template instantiations in order to do some computation at compile time. And the mechanism is uh, obscure and obtuse and not easy to understand and not easy to debug because you kind of have to force the compiler to fail in order to see what the intermediate output is of your attempted recursive template instantiation, and it also chews up lots of resources on the compiler, makes compilation go slow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for simple computations like I have a uh, parameter pack that has a variable number of types in the parameters, just how many is in the list? Well, that's a question that we can ask at compile time, and it, it should be simple, but without const expert functions, you end up having to do some kind of crazy recursive instantiation that bubbles up a plus one at every level of the instantiation until you finally get the answer. So, const expr in C17 um, for lambdas gives you the ability to invoke lambdas at as a compile time function. Uh, I'm now, as I said, a const expr function can be called at runtime. It works just the same. 
Uh, so I'm just using it as a runtime function here. It's merely meant to illustrate the example. Um, but I am first doing a transform and then doing the for each. Uh, if uh, this transform and all my values were const expert, then this whole thing would evaluate at compile time. Um, there's probably a way to work it out to, to get that to happen. I just didn't feel like spending enough time on it. But if you need to do computation at compile time and you're using const expert functions, and you would find it handy to use a lambda, say to generalize some of your compile time code, you know, sometimes you're doing a plus, sometimes you're doing a minus. Why should I have to write this code twice? Why can't I just pass in a lambda that does either the minus or the plus, evaluate that at compile time? That would, a const expert lambda would give you the ability to do that. The next thing that we got in um, C++ 17, you noticed before when we were capturing this, we could only capture the this pointer. If we capture star this, then we can capture a complete copy of the instance that is pointed to by this. And again, this has to be done within the context of a member function because otherwise you don't have a this pointer. But here in my little handwritten example, I've got this little struct that I've called bucket. My function call operator takes the bucket by const reference, but holds a, a copy of the bucket by value. So I'm initializing the copy by value from the reference. And then the function call operator, um, and I guess strictly speaking to be consistent the way I've written the Lambda, since I didn't write it mutable, this function call operator should be const. It's what we were saying earlier. I'm referencing the captured instance um, and getting at its fields. Now, that's not too bad. I mean, you know, this is, you know, these are small examples, so they don't uh, exemplify the boilerplate, you know, too much. I mean, if you write this once, it's not so bad. You write it 50 times, you're getting really tired of it. So down here, when I capture star this, I can refer to those members just as if they, as if this uh, lambda expression were a function call defined on bucket, a function call operator method defined on bucket. I can just reference name and value here just fine. The other interesting thing is that were this to be a mutable lambda, and then I modified name, because this is a copy of the this object, this name here would not be getting modified. Let's revert that back. So to summarize, prior, prior to C++17, we could only capture the this pointer. We could not capture a complete copy of the object of the instance pointed to by this. But if we write star this in C++17, C++ we can capture a copy of the object. And the other change that we got in C++ C++ 17 was the ability to write lambdas that are const expert so they can be evaluated at compilation time. So now, getting on to C++ 20, uh, there is one subtle detail with regard to auto parameters that I, I didn't discuss, and that is you can all, it's not just a single template argument, it can also be a parameter pack I uh, just didn't feel like parameter packs are on everybody's, at you know, the forefront of everybody's mind, so I didn't go through the details of that, but you can find the details on cppreference.com. So if you're into writing template functions, you're going to be very familiar with the idea of like explicitly named template arguments as an explicit list, and then also the idea of parameter packs, which are just kind of like var arg template arguments is the way to think of it. So you can also write Lambda functions that work on parameter packs. And that goes for the initializing expression as well. The, you can have the initializing expression be initialized from 
um, a parameter pack expression. Okay, so now C20 took this even further, and now between the capture list, which in this case is empty, and the parameter list, which down here is this funky syntax for accepting a fixed size array. I'll explain that in a second. We can name using template uh, argument angle bracket syntax. We can explicitly name the template arguments and possibly their type. So in this case, I've shown that this template argument to this generic lambda is a si the second argument is a size t, so it's not something generic. It's a specific type, namely it's uh, an integral type. So it is um, of the two kinds of uh, types that there are two kinds of template parameters that you can have. You can have types, or you can have integral types. And I believe in C plus plus twenty they extended that to. Uh, I think it got extended to floats and strings. I I haven't researched that the latest on that. So. Don't take my word for it. I know it was proposed at one point. And then my first template argument here is just some generic type T. And the reason that I'm doing this is so that I can say I want to do, I want to accept as the argument to my lambda function a fixed size array. The size of the array is n, and the type of the elements of the array is T. Now it turns out if you want to do that, you have to write the identifier as a reference inside parentheses in order for it to, to be deduced correctly. Without the reference, it would copy the array. That's not what we want. And due to the uh, funky nature of C++'s uh, syntax with respect to some of these things, the, the, the binding order, which it inherited from C, we have to put parentheses around this whole thing to get the precedence to work right. So that means my lambda can loop over all of the elements in the array and print them out. And the equivalent thing that I've done up here, this looks very similar. The only thing that's really different is the return type is explicitly specified and I've written it as a function call operator, a member function, but otherwise this body is the same and this list of template arguments is the same. So uh, without the ability to specify the template arguments here explicitly, it wouldn't be possible for me to, to succinctly just pass this array to my lambda function, this array up here. So it's not a vector anymore. It's a, it's a fixed length C style array. The compiler knows that it's of length three because the compiler constructed it to fit exactly the initializing list, which has three elements. So this is three ints, and it's very handy to just be able to say, here, just take this array of this fixed length array, let the compiler deduce the size of the array so that my code can walk over the array without going off the end, and you know, just deal with it more succinctly instead of making me write something like, you know, lambda values and three. Because now this three. You know, what if I add another value here, then the three doesn't match up anymore and so on. And, you know, some people say like, oh, it's size of values divided by size of. Int is another way to get something that specifies the length of the array without having to specify the length explicitly. So if I change this initializer list, then this code matches the new initializing list. But this is just ugh, noise. Why do I even have to write that? So. If I get the ability to name my template parameters, I can use the deductive power of arguments passed to template functions, how the compiler deduces the corresponding template types from the actual arguments. And this would also work if I had, uh, you know, if I had a, uh, oops, if I had a, a fixed length array of strings, so that's an array of three stood strings.
works for that too because all we're doing here is deducing n is still 3. I could, you know, could make it, okay, so now n is 4, and t was deduced to be stood string. And because it was an argument declared as a reference, we didn't make a copy of this array of four strings before we started operating on it. Uh, and in fact, you know, because I'm not modifying it, this thing, you know, could be const if I really want it to be. So um, there's other tricks that make it very useful to specify explicit identifiers for the types associated with the generic argument, with, with the arguments, the template arguments to a generic lambda. And the one that a lot of people use as the kind of canonical example, we'll just code it up real quick here, is suppose I have a function, a lambda function, uh, SS takes two template arguments, and I want to say that the return type is whatever the result of adding s and t is. That's what the return type is. And then I say return s plus t. Now, I can't... Oh, well, in this case, I'm referencing the... Let's just do it like this. I was referencing the names of the parameters and not their types. But um, if I have some kind of complex generic lambda, there are many times where it's easier to write the return type of the lambda using decal type and some expression involving the types. Um, I may also, you know, do some kind of type function metaprogramming on the S and the T to get some other kind of type, and then that's the result, uh, the resulting type of this lambda. Now, in this case, what's really interesting is that the trailing return type here, you might ask, you know, like, well, why didn't they just put the, re you know, the return type first, like regular functions? And the answer is, if you use the trailing return type by the time syntactically we get to parsing this trailing return type business, we've already seen the identifiers that describe the names of the arguments and their types. So we can use those identifiers in this return type expression, and now we're not kind of putting the cart before the horse trying to reference a type before we've even said what the type is. Okay, so... Um, However, I think, you know, for ordinary everyday programming, I think kind of you, having something that works for fixed length arrays is kind of handy and useful um, as much as dynamically resized arrays are very useful, like std vector, you know, th this fixed length arrays just declared and initialized. It, it's it, something that's around all the time. So um, I find this kind of business where I can name these types and then use the... Uh, generic type deduction mechanism of templated functions to deduce the n and the t for me, it makes it a lot more simpler to work on fixed length arrays. Okay, so our last thing that we're going to look at is, and we'll describe this comment here in a second, but um, if you aren't yet familiar with concepts, let's just take a look at Concepts really quick, just a simple example here. So a concept is basically uh, something introduced by this new concept keyword. And this provides a named concept. It is basically a, a way to describe a set of requirements associated with a type. And so this is the name for the group of requirements. The type that it's going to be associated with is the template argument. And the way we specify the requirements is through a series of requires uh, clauses. And in this case, we're saying we're going to require that the type T for some instance A of that type 
has a set of uh, expressions that are required to be true. And this expression is saying, if I instantiate std hash of t, so std hash is, is a standard hashing function. So I'm creating an instance of the hashing function. I'm invoking that function with the instance of t. It's a hash on all, it's a hash on the type t, and I'm invoking it with this specific instance of type t. The result of that expression, so that's result of that expression is convertible to std size t. So if you look at um, the hash mechanism in the standard library, it says you can specialize std hash for your own types and that the function call operator has to return something that something does not have to be size t, although it usually is. It's just usually most straightforward to return a value of size t explicitly but it could be some proxy class that is convertible to a size t. So we are trying to capture that requirement here by saying it's not that this expression must return something that is size t. It must return something that is convertible to a size t. So we're being very, um, I guess we're being strict in our laxness, if you will. We're being very specific about exactly is what is required. So it's not required that you return size t explicitly, but the thing that you return must be convertible to size t. So any any type t, when an instance of t is put into this expression, the resulting type will be convertible to size t. That's what we're interested in. So down here, I've written my function call uh, struct again. Now, the whole concept business is new to C++20, so strictly speaking, this printer struct is no longer C++98 because I'm trying to imitate what the generated function call operator does from the compiler. We're saying that our function call operator is a templated member function, and the templated argument is constrained such that it must meet the requirements of whatever the concept hashable of T requires. So, um, ints are hashable, std strings are hashable. You know, I don't have to write my own hash function. So I can invoke uh, for each on this fixed length array. I'm using uh, std begin global function and std end global function to get beginning and ending iterators to this fixed length array. And I am running this printer function over all the values. It's going to print the value and whatever the hash of the value is with a tab in between. I'm going to do the same thing for this vector of std strings. I'm just going to run my for each over them. And I've done it this way, uh, both on integers and on strings, because I want to you know, demonstrate that this is a, uh, a template function. So, down here in my Lambda, let's just ignore the comment for a second. Let me collapse that. Okay. So in my Lambda, what I've done is I've said it's a generic Lambda, and I'm specifying that the template argument to the Lambda must be a type that is consistent with the concept hashable. So there's two ways that you can write this uh, conforming expression. And this is the way, this is one way where I can just specify, instead of saying uh, class or type name, I can specify the name of the concept. And that says that this template argument must satisfy the requirements of this concept. And again, I'm just printing out the value and in a tab and then the hash of the value. I can do it for integers and do it for a vector of strings. Now, this little comment here that I was collapsing is uh, I'm using Visual Studio 2019 here, which is pretty up to date. Uh, they, Charles was just telling me at the beginning of this, before we started, that they just barely released a new uh, compiler update. I am not on the, the very latest. I'm one behind. Now, um, 
there's two ways that you could write this. The other way that you could write it is, you know, the more familiar type name here. And then down here, you put requires, if I could spell it, requires hashable of T. But you can see that Visual Studio is not happy with this. It, it puts a squiggle here. It's, it, it's, it gets confused. What I wrote was equivalent syntax for this example. And that works fine for this example. However, the fully general syntax of adding constraints to the template parameters of a Lambda expression allows you to write these require expressions directly on the Lambda. So here I'm defining a named concept and I'm referencing that named concept in the template parameter list. But sometimes you don't have a named concept and you just want to write a requirement on the type. And so it, to do that, you would write the, uh, the required expression here. Uh, it just looks like this particular version of Visual Studio, which as I said, is one behind at this time, uh, did not recognize that syntax correctly. Um, I got a little compiler example here that I can just show you that it does work. Okay, so here I've written, I'm still using the concept name, but I'm using a require clause after the uh, generic Lambda parameter list. And you can see that that compiled successfully. So um, it's just a shortcoming in Visual Studio. It's not a shortcoming in uh, the feature. Um, and with this, why, why would you care? Why would you care if you use this concepts business in your generic Lambda? Well, the reason you would care is because if you instantiated this Lambda with some type that wasn't hashable and you did it without using a concept, then the compiler is likely to, you know, spew out, you know, tens or hundreds of lines of error messages as it instantiates all this stuff and tries all these different possibilities and comes to the conclusion that nothing is compatible with the syntax that you've written, most likely because you supplied some T that wasn't specialized for which, or rather for which stood hash is not specialized. So it's some T that isn't hashable, but the error message that you get is after a whole bunch of puke from the compiler in the bottom, it says, I couldn't instantiate this. And then you have to work your way backwards like Sherlock Holmes and deduce exactly what's going on and play compiler and do, you know, type deduction and type inference and all that stuff. Whereas if you use a concept and the type is not compatible, it basically just puts out a single message that says, this T that you gave me is not consistent with the requirements of hashable. And then you remember, oh yeah, I didn't write a hash function for my custom type. So much better to use concepts with generics, whether it's non lambdas or regular templated functions or template classes so that your error messages when you make a mistake are easier to diagnose and get to the the root cause of the problem so uh just if you were curious i mean it's not exciting but we can see the output of this code you know It's just kind of diagnostic more than it is instructive. But in each case, it's showing here's what the classic code output and here's what the Lambda output. And in each case, it's the same output. Um, here are those hashes that we output. And you can see that the hash is the same for the two implementations or the two invocations of the hash function. So. Uh, that's basically it in a nutshell. The only parts of lambdas that I didn't go over were the stuff relating to parameter packs. I just feel like that's kind of, it, it's not that it's hard to understand, but it's kind of at the edge of most people's day-to-day -day usage of C++. And I feel like it kind of just kind of drowns people in, uh, in, in, in syntactic noise and stuff that it, it doesn't really resonate, doesn't stick with you. 
uh, in the chat uh, for a reference, there's a remark by Cesar says uh, for array reference capture, I can use auto ref argument. What is the advantage of a template? Um, you mean the named template arguments? Oh, I see what you're saying. When you when, okay, yeah, I I get it now. Uh, let's go back to this example. Okay, so you're saying I could have just used auto. Yes. Auto, auto ref array. Yeah. Oh yeah. What's the, what's no, the, I what's the I size of the array? <laughs> That's what you meant. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but you can use a for loop, right? Or for a yeah, a for range, uh, right? You could, yes. So if you said, you know, for, um, I guess it's a T, you know, val. Auto, auto A in array. array, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess, yeah, here we're not even using this. So we'd have to say auto here as well. Um, yeah, but you're right. You, you don't have N, the N, N. Yeah, I mean, and if I, if I don't actually need to know the value of N, then... Okay. This is sufficient as well, but um, I, I mean, in my code, I'm not really using, um, I'm not using, you know, I as a value here, but, you know, sometimes you have things like, you know, output the index and then a space and then the value, or sometimes this I ends up being used, oh, we have to put this back to what it was, T array ref of N. You know, sometimes you use this value I or use the value N in calls to other functions that are inside the body of the Lambda. And in that case, you need to get the, the uh, template argument machinery to deduce the T and the N for you. But yes, in my simple example, yeah. I could have used auto and it would have been just fine. I wasn't, you know, until I added this reference to I here. Now I'm really stuck. I can't, I, I'd have to, you know, keep my own counter separately and... I guess, you know, if I did something like, uh, you know, I plus, N, you know, N minus three or some weird thing, you know, something where I was using N and I, I needed that as part of my body. But as I wrote it originally, yes, it was just, it's just a simple example to show, you know, kind of typical things people might want to use to deduce T and N. And with that was, again, just a simple way to, show the utility of, of these named template arguments to a generic Lambda. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, thanks. Okay. I understand. Uh, any other questions? Or if not, we will wrap it up. It's 90 minutes of talking about Lambdas. It's probably enough for anybody. Okay, thanks for uh, showing up.